<laughs> yeah, yeah, I was thinking about your experiences with psychoanalysis. Would, you, would it be possible to find out the persons who are most important for you and why? With your training and... Yes, it would be possible, yeah. because they're, they're quite clearly in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it relates to the rather curious way that I came into the psychoanalysis. Maybe I'll just tell that story briefly, um, because I, it was very unexpected. I hardly knew who Freud was. I mean, I was really ignorant, because I was at Cambridge having done classics and then English, and I was writing a PhD on the 19th century novelist George Eliot and the impact of science and contemporary thinking on her work. And that took me deeper and deeper into why it became increasingly difficult for her to complete her novels in a um, satisfactory way, really. And then at the end of her last big novel, um, Daniel Deronda, in fact, there isn't a couple get together and it's all happy ever after. Um, and she, belonging to a, a psychological um, strain of thinking, really, of, of the most advanced kind, had a feeling for the unconscious, the unmapped country within, she called it, um, <clears throat> without having a theory. The theory had to wait for Freud. Although I have to say that Freud gave um, a copy of one of her finest books, Middlemarch, to Martha Bernays during the um, uh, um, when he, she was his fiance. So, uh, but I was. It was also a very troubled time at um, Cambridge, politically in particular. It was the sixties, and there was a lot of um, disturbance of the establishment norms, I would say. And uh, I knew several people in the local mental hospital. Two of my friends had committed suicide. One of them had been killed in Biafra, a young medical student. And um, I had a, a conversation with a friend of mine saying, I, I shouldn't be here being a scholar. I should be helping somehow. And she said, um, this is a long story, but the short version, is she said, well, go and see my godfather um, in London. He works in a clinic in London. Um, his name's John Bowlby. You won't have heard of him. You won't have heard of him, that's quite right. Um, and he works at the Tavistock. So very innocently, I knocked on his door, not knowing how influential and well-known he was already. Uh, and he talked to me for an hour. And um, he said, I think it would be good if you went up the corridor and talked to my um, colleague, Martha Harris, who's head of the uh, child psychotherapy training. And if you do come and work here, I could be your godfather too. Such an incredibly kindly, lovely man who remained my godfather throughout what was to be my training. So I went up and I just knocked on Martha Harris's door. And after a very nice conversation with her, which I don't remember in its detail very well, she said to me, well, what's your academic background? I mean, what did you, have you studied any psychology? And I said, no, I haven't um, read any psychology, actually. She said, what have you been doing? Um, and I said, I've been doing a PhD on George Eliot. And she said, oh, well then, no, no reason for psychology. And that was the beginning of my, my work there. She let me onto the training. I had, I'd heard of, from my, my um, friend in Cambridge, I'd heard of the Institute of Psychoanalysis, but I thought you couldn't get in unless you were a doctor. And my family... I didn't have enough money to put me through medical training, having put me through education and, and Cambridge. Um, but actually it was the best possible thing that happened to do the child psychotherapy training first, an adult. So she let me in, and she was a very um, central figure, really, and counterforce 
to my own tendency to um, go straight for the books, to, I, I don't know, just absolutely fill my, fill myself with learning and in the conventional way. I'd always been a, an exam passer of the worst kind, of the in one ear, out the other sort. Um, when I said to her at the beginning of the two-year infant observation that precedes the training, um, what should I read before I start observing this baby? And she looked at me and she said, don't read anything for at least two years. And that, you know, I learned a lot from that. She just was saying, in effect, be open to your own experience. See what it feels like to be in the room with this family and the baby. And uh, it was a total revelation, absolute revelation. Um, so she was one of the central figures. Bowlby was, in terms of a, a support. Um, <clears throat> early on in my training, we had what was a, a very special day for the whole clinic. It stopped working, and because this person, Wilfred Bion, and his wife were coming for a couple of days seminars, all day seminars. So I went to those, found them both very strange and extremely helpful. And I remember one reason it was helpful in particular, um, apart from the wonderful atmosphere, actually. It's, it's interesting what, what a sense of community and um, everyone being equal, really, that the Tavistock fostered in those days, I have to say. And uh, he, he said, it, it's um, sometimes difficult when you're training, doing psychoanalytic training of any kind, sometimes difficult to see um, the wisdom for the knowledge. Unforgettable, the wisdom for the knowledge. So I felt that when I read more of his theory and knew a bit more about K and minus K, um, that is genuine knowledge in the sense of getting to know and understand somebody else, you in the other person, the other person in you, and some of the theories that would be relevant to that. Um, I realized just how much um, a time I hadn't wasted. I'm not sorry that I, I read Darwin and um, Huxley and all those people during the 19th century, but they were, that it was very, very important to learn the difference between wisdom and the, the sort of minus K knowledge. So that, that, so that was Bion. Um, Meltzer was a tremendously big influence. He was working a lot with his students of the um, Tavistock and he eventually, much later, uh, married Martha Harris in fact. So as a supervisor and as a seminar leader, I was exposed to somebody who seemed to have psychoanalytic wisdom so deeply inside him that he, very like Bion actually, he came to give seminars without any notes at all. So the book, I remember sitting through the seminars that became the book, The Kleinian Development. He had a little tape recorder and he just talked into the tape recorder and it was typed up and that was a book. So he just knew it so deeply <coughs> and believed it. But not in a sense of a leader, though he's sometimes been accused of this, a sort of apostolic succession that he gathered mm -hmm. around him. More in the sense of um, what he said once to me, does my way of seeing things enable you to see it your way? only more clearly. In other words, he was trying to encourage us all to think for ourselves rather than, <coughs> I don't know, to nail our colours to any particular mast. So there was beyond, there was um, the whole adolescent department, I think, were completely crucial to me, it was in the early days. Um, the adolescent department hadn't been going, I mean, the, the tally <coughs> Founded in 48, the adolescent department really got going 
uh, in the early 60s with some great people, um, George Thomas from Chile, uh, uh, and we'll have to have a pause there while my memory reco uh, recovers. Um, Doug Moore Hunter was my first supervisor, Iska Wittenberg, I think I mentioned. They were, they were formative in terms of enabling me to understand the ongoing infantile, young child and adolescent states of mind in all of us. So in terms of ultimately my work, it was always to do with thinking um, about <coughs> forward-looking experiences of what enable things to go right rather than things that go wrong. So although I taught Freud, uh, oh yes, well then, of course, I, I left and this is all rather long-winded, I'm sorry. I, I left and got a job in the community working with very disturbed people for pretty well no money. And then I got a strange phone call from someone I just about heard of who worked at the town stop called um, Anton Opolzer, who said, there's a, there's a job going in the adolescent department. I, maybe, I think you should apply for it. So I said I couldn't possibly apply for it. There'll be hundreds of applications. And um, no, he said, well, just throw your hat in the ring and see what happens. They may as well know that you're interested in coming back to the Tavistock to teach one day. Because I hadn't got that in mind at all. So I thought the Tavistock wouldn't need. Um, anyway, I got the job. I, was left, I wasn't even shortlisted. One of the senior Freudians there said, that we can't just leave one person off the shortlist. This person, Margot Woodell, whoever she is, will put her back on the shortlist. So I got the job. So I've, uh, And I thank Anton Oppolzer ever after, because he was a bit like John Bowlby, actually, for me. He was a kind of godfather throughout the training, with all his humour and delight. Um, and so I eventually qualified there. After being called back and getting the job, thanks to Anton, I worked as a child and adolescent psychotherapist in the adolescent department for some years. And um, then began to feel that I'd done the training when I was very young and there was so much I still didn't understand. And I have to add quickly, still don't understand about psychoanalytic thinking, and maybe I should apply to the Institute. So um, I did apply, and the people I think who were most formative there were um, John Steiner, Ron Britton, Red O'Shaughnessy, um, certainly Robin Anderson, who'd been at the Tavistock while I was there in the same department, and we worked closely together. But when I sat in on his seminars, I realised what a what a thinker he was, is, and uh, what a very special person. So Robin, and quite a few others, my cohort, my my peers. Um, but since then, I suppose I've. I've settled with trying to understand beyond, above all. I never met Klein. Um, so as a figure, of course her thinking is very, very important to me, but as someone I knew as part of the training, um, it, it was post-Kleinian thinking, really. But actually, it, it's very difficult after a while, I don't know what you feel, in fact, to invoke any one figure rather than another, because I think one finds a way of learning from practically everyone. I mean, I, I want my patients, some of my patients have been so influential in how I think. Um, but those were the figures, to answer your question. What was, what was the personal experience of contact with Wilfred? Beyond. You mentioned his. Yes, my personal experience with him himself was very 
um, limited to these seminars that I went to. That they were huge, and I certainly didn't say anything. I was far too frightened in those days to say anything at all. But I drank him in, and there was most the first time I ever saw him, Martha Harris was chairing. She was very, very fond of him and his thinking. And she said, uh, now, Dr. Bion, would you like to be sitting down to talk, or would you like to stand up with the microphone? And he said, I think I'd like to stand up. And he slowly got up, and I remember his legs, I absolutely vivid memory, he just went on and on and on. And I just thought, there he goes, so tall, I can't believe this. And then when he got there, this is actually quite telling, when he got there, he said, I think I'm a bit far away. I think I'll sit down again. And he slowly <laughs> sat down. And then he just started talking. And he talked for the next probably eight hours. Which year it was? Uh, it was 78. 78. Mm -hmm. So well, it wasn't long before he died, actually. Yeah, after coming back from the States. Yeah. Well, he was still in the States, maybe it was 77 to start with, because they came back for the summer. They got really hot, and he and Francesca really liked to come to the Tavistock, where he had been originally. Yeah. Um, when he originated from. Yeah, yeah, he did, yeah. And Francesca became a close friend, and I used to meet up with her and mainly her daughter, Nicola, who came to one of my infant observation seminars, actually. That was very nice. She, was a, she is a publisher, she was a publisher then. But, and I can't even remember how she got into my infant observation seminar, but we had a very good two years together. How do I remember him? He came over as um, ever inquiring, not just like Meltzer, not ever having a note um, to refer to, and yet somehow what he was trying to say absolutely came round and added up. Might be in a morning, you'd come back to where he started off and realise that it all made complete sense. But in no sense in a didactic way, in an evocative way. And um, I felt he was, yes, inquiring, actually pretty humble very much emphasising how much there was to learn still, put me in mind, I had read my Freud by then, and it put me in mind of his saying early on that where human nature is concerned, um, we're only in the foothills of understanding. That was really what Bjorn was saying too. And I think the, the, the Tavistock was particularly open to that way of thinking, particularly open, obviously, to his work on groups, which had only, and the publication of the book, Experiences in Groups, the leaderless group, which um, was the beginning of his work at Northfields with Rickman. Um, actually, it wasn't the beginning, but it's the beginning that we know. Uh, was, a, was part of the culture of the Tavistock, so we had group relations conferences, and we all took part and were very astonished when we were put in groups where there wasn't a leader. And I, I was completely confounded by that and by what happened as a consequence that the leader did emerge. One more question. Mm. Beyond and Model became establishment at the moment and is ever present. Mm. Do you think mm. we'll have some alternative? way of thinking instead of a container contained about emotional processes. Now my first comment is that I think Bjorn would be absolutely horrified to hear you say that, that he was in any sense establishment because he hated the establishment and he'd probably hate the establishment of psychoanalysis now. I don't, I don't know, of course one can't possibly tell. I think it'll take a long time actually because his thinking is so incredibly complex and very difficult to teach. Very few people can, it's not like you can just pass on 
this is what beyond meant, that's what that means, etc. I think, again, and this is obviously the theme of this morning, one has to find some way in which his thinking can help you think more clearly. But that is going to take a long time. And he, his thinking changed so massively as time went on. So container contained was comparatively early. And I think that's been, certainly in England, I think it's been a bit traduced. Everyone talks about container contained as if they know what they're talking about you know, they mean. But actually, it's such an unbelievably two-way process of the moment. Hence, you know, I mean, I think that's what he did mean by the effort to be without desire, um, memory or understanding. It, w it was work absolutely in the moment in terms of the unconscious impact, one on the other, of the patient and analyst. And that may not be pass honorable in the sense that I feel that's only possible, that kind of intuitive sense of truth, which he did talk about a lot, sense of truth, um, can be acquired, um, can't be taught, except by example, possibly. Um, and that's why I think Francesca, his wife for so many years and such an incredibly talented person herself, valued the last work, the uh, memoir of the future, the most. Mm -hmm. Because it, it's, it's all there without the, what he called the satanic jargonier, the sort of deadly jargon maker of um, psychoanalytic phraseology and so on, which in a sense we all need still, don't we? I mean, otherwise we don't know what we're talking about. So we, we do need words like projective identification, but we also need constantly to examine them for not just what it, they originally meant, but for the new meanings that are accruing.